Hey guys. Okay, so I'm here with two of my favorite people who I've met from the Discord verse. I've got Alex Malpass and I've got Philoso Speak Sophist. Uh, Malpass is a philosophy PhD. Philosophy Speak Sophist is a uh, computer science PhD. And a lot of you guys wanted to see a review of the Molyneux debate, so I figured, you know, I'll get some people who are smarter than me and we will have a discussion about it. So, uh, how are you guys? I'm you good. Too. Awesome. And, uh, yeah, Malpass has some um, content on the internet. There's a website, there's um, also a YouTube channel that's linked below. Uh, PS doesn't really have any content, but there is a recording of him. Uh, completely owning someone in a debate, so I'll link that below. Um, so I guess for uh, for this talk, I think we'll just have a basic structure, we'll just do it freeform, and we'll try not to go on forever. So the the basic structure that we'll do kind of freeform around, I'm thinking we'll just all give, give our take and just react to each other's takes. That seems simple enough for me. You guys good with that? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Um, do one of you want to go first, or should I break the ice? You go for it. Okay. Um, well, my take is pretty straightforward. Oh, and, and also, please do not hesitate to be critical of anything I say. It doesn't matter that it's my channel. I would very much appreciate any criticism you have. Um, so my take is pretty simple. Um, I think that Molyneux basically spent two hours dodging a hypothetical that showed the unpalatable conclusion to his view. Uh, if I had to elaborate on that, I think what I'd say is that the debate opened with me asking him, what is it that's true of animals that were this thing true of humans would justify not giving them the non-aggression principle? So his, uh, his set of traits was threefold. So he said the inability to engage in abstract moral reasoning, um, the inability to reproduce more beings who can engage in this kind of reasoning, and the absence of a cure. So we know that if those three traits are present, According to Molyneux, he should be fine not giving the non-aggression principle to uh, the beings in question. Now, I gave him a hypothetical. Um, I said, okay, so <clears throat> let's take humans, and then let's say that um, the majority of them are sufficiently disabled that they can't engage in this kind of abstract reasoning. So he can no longer talk about humans belonging to a category that on average is capable of engaging in this reasoning. Uh, there's no cure and they're also sterile, so they can't reproduce. In this situation, Molyneux should be fine with not giving the beings in question the non-aggression principle, with murdering them if we want to. Um, now, he would just avoid this uh, conclusion to his view, and he would always do one of two things. So he would either, um, he would either modify the hypothetical and then accept it, or he would not modify it, but instead just say there's something wrong with it. And I guess just quickly on those two things, I think that the modification stuff is um, no good because, look, if you say that once these three criteria are met, it's fine to murder the beings that we're talking about, um, what's not reasonable to do is to then add some property to the situation, which is not entailed by the three properties you gave, right? So it's like, if you give these three properties, there's some big set of possible worlds where those properties are in place. If you add some factor, like for example, the beings in question are suffering, that's just going to apply to some subset of the worlds where you're supposed to be okay with the murder, right? To then just talk about that subset and say, oh, well, in this subset, you know, it seems reasonable enough to murder the beings in question. That's just dodging the fact that with your three criteria in place, there's this whole range of other situations where you're supposed to be fine uh, with the murder. And then the other pathway, of just saying there's something wrong with the hypothetical. Uh, he would just try to say it's impossible without actually showing how there's something like logically impossible about it, like a contradiction or invalid inference or something like this. Or he would just change around what he meant by something being characteristic of, of humans or, or what he meant by the category of humans or what he meant by norm. Is it the average? Is it something about how a properly functioning human works, etc. So that's my uh, that's my general take. Uh, yeah, shall I go next then? I don't... Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, you can give your own, react, whatever you prefer. Okay, so um, quite a lot of it uh, felt to me a bit like, I don't know, I thought of an analogy, which was a bit like you were saying something like, um, like if you were locked in a prison cell, then you wouldn't be able to get out, right? And he went, no, because maybe I'd have a key. And you're like, <laughs> okay, 
say you don't have a key. You go, oh, no, because maybe there'd be a tunnel. And you're like, okay, say there isn't a tunnel or a key. Uh, maybe I could fit through the window. And like, it was just <laughs> a, a kind of weird, um, I, I don't know. So it, it went on like that. It was a bit like chase the exception or something. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm not sure if crediting him with he was doing it on purpose to avoid the conclusion is to kind of give a sense that there was um, a grasp of the situation that was kind of commanding and it was a deliberate um, strategy of obfuscation rather than just a kind of um, impulse towards pedantry or something. Like I'm not (laughs) sure which one of those it was. So uh, there was something quite frustrating about... uh, And I think it was was kind of... um, There was something... Like, um, it, that's the sort of thing that people think philosophy just is. It's just like um, trivial kind of, um, it, like fictional, fiction creative writing or something where you're just pretending um, in things that don't really have any substance. That, 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 that it gave the, the type of argument we were trying to have, um, like it did a disservice to it with the way that it was like driven into the ground or something. So, so that, those are my overall kind of impressions. Yep. I want to make one comment before we go to uh, PS. I, I agree with all of that. Um, if my comment implied that it was deliberate as in he, he totally understands what I'm doing and he's like consciously avoiding, I wasn't trying to actually even imply that it could be just like you said, an impulse towards pedantry or just, you know, a lack of understanding and just, just I, I mean i have no idea but i'm not implying that he actually fully grasped what happened there um what about you uh ps do you have do you have a take um well i agree with what you both said i think that fundamentally i don't understand how you can do philosophy i think hypotheticals are just straightforwardly indispensable not just to philosophy but i think to most domains of thought like i don't know how you can do mathematics without it i don't know how you can do a lot of natural science without it um, I think when I was when I was listening to it, it seemed like he just totally missed the point of the hypothetical. He he it, he thought it was a, it, it almost seemed like he was treating it as like a like a, a world building exercise, and like instead of like that, I think the idea behind what you were doing was that you're trying to show some sort of intuition, and I think that's what a lot of times hypotheticals do. What their point is is that. That you when you when you construct some hypothetical, the idea is that it's supposed to illuminate some sort of underlying intuition, and then they'll that person will think, oh, okay, well, you know, if that's the case, then I guess what I originally thought might be wrong. Um, and when you totally mess with the hypothetical in that way, you're just totally missing the point. So I don't even see the the purpose at all of doing that. Um, and if he's against hypotheticals, I don't know how he's okay with any sort of conditionals, any sort of counterfactuals. Uh, any kind of thought experiment. I just don't see how you can do anything without uh, accepting hypotheticals in general. So that's probably what I would say. Um, yeah, I mean, that se- that seems all to make sense to me. I see you unmuted, uh, Malpass. You have something? Yeah. So I think I mean, just to play devil's advocate to some extent, I think there is a distinction between like um, so uh, like a counterfactual where like you're going to appeal to some um event in the actual history and like uh reason about what would follow had that event gone differently like so you might say you know um you let's say we're betting on a coin or something and you bet that it lands heads but actually it lands tails so i take the money and you and then you can say well had the coin landed heads then i would have taken the money right and then what you're and that seems right. Like what you just reasoned about was right, um, because like the small deviation from actuality, you can kind of still track what would what would have followed in that situation. So that's cool. So what's going on there is the um, the situation is quite strongly grounded in the actual world, right? We are deviating in a hypothetical, but like it's tied very strongly to the actual world. And that sense of um, counterfactual is what goes on. A, a lot in science um, that you know so when we talk about like necessary connections between events or whatever there's some um, there's some sense in which that talk is all about like 
you know, had things gone differently, then that would have followed, right? That that's like intimately wrapped up in that type of thing. But then on the other hand, there's a much there's a different type of hypothetical use, um, which is like a bit closer to that kind of like Einsteinian idea of like a thought experiment or something, where like you just go like imagine a universe where there's just like a carbon sphere and nothing else, and but and like then well, you're not deviating from some event that actually happened in the past or something, right? It, you're, it's just complete like. Um, like all it's just like a playground for ideas you're just testing how the concepts fit together and there's no reason for it to sit like closely to what's actual in any way right you're just playing with ideas completely in the abstract um, and both of those are uses of hypotheticals right because it doesn't matter that there isn't um, a world with a carbon sphere and it doesn't matter that the coin didn't land heads right both of them account are uh, hypothetical um, and I felt like somehow maybe um, I mean, obviously, your usage was much more to be like a uh, playground of ideas kind of use of a hypothetical mm. rather than like testing actual causal connections between events in the actual world or something, right? So, but then somehow um, it was a bit like Stefan sort of s- switched between those two sometimes when it suited him. So sometimes it would be like, oh, that's that's not realistic. That, you know, the actual world would never be like that. So So I can discount that as if it was something more like the first type when mm. uh, but then he would play along with it being the second type when uh, at other points in the conversation when he'd be like okay so let's say it's a cat god from Egypt that blah 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 and then obviously at that point we're just playing it's just like imagination and testing the ideas in a sand, sandbox or something so I felt like he just he, I don't know whether he just didn't like really grasp the, that distinction and sort of like floating between them a bit which, I don't know yeah th- I, I, that's all I wanted to say really I think yeah, um, I think. No, go ahead, sir. No, no, you go ahead. It's fine. Well, I was, I was, I was going to say two things. One is that I think there is, there is, there are actual serious um, concerns and things about certain kinds of quote unquote hypotheticals. So, like for instance, there are philosophers who think that um, certain kinds of thought experiments or hypotheticals um, aren't actually helpful. Like for instance, I don't know if you guys are familiar, like Swamp Man, for instance, that's a pretty one, famous one by Davidson. Some people, like I think Dennett at one point was saying that it, those kind of, they're so far away from what the actual world is like that they, they don't help anymore. Sometimes some of Parfit's um, examples of you know um, amoeba-like people splitting in two, so there have been actual serious takes on or serious views that those kinds of thought experiments aren't actually helpful anymore and they don't actually help because they're so far removed from reality. So I think there might be something to that. Um, but I, I think what I was also going to bring up is what do you guys take the sort of necessary um, features of like good hypotheticals to be? I think obviously one would like a simple one might be just logical possibility, right? That's what if I was someone say, gives yeah. if someone gives a hypothetical that's clearly contradictory, right? Then I think that's just a trivial case where you can you can you don't have to entertain it or uh, talk about it, but are, do you think there's anything more to hypotheticals? Because um, I think some people might say that it needs to be at least somewhat closely grounded with the way the actual world is in certain cases, like um, I think Alex was saying. Um, because if you get too far removed, you lose any benefit in terms of intuition. I, well, I think... Well, mine, mine's quick. I was just going to say, I think it would depend on the purpose of the hypothetical so kind of like what alex was saying uh, you might you might have different purposes that you're going for um and so like the distinction he made was between trying to sort of like uh kind of like plot out what might happen in reality if something went differently versus just a playground of ideas i mean if you were trying to do the former then it seems like you wouldn't want something so far with with such massive alterations that you just couldn't really like predict what would happen or something so I think it might be when you ask, like, what are the conditions for a good hypothetical? I think that that might be like relativized to what it is the hypothetical is trying to do in the first place. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I think that there's um, there's not just one type of hypothetical, uh, uh, one type of like conditional or something um, where we could subsume all of the different uses we might have for them under um but i think i mean i think this we could i could certainly talk about this for a long time but 
when it comes to those so there's something some kind of easy to misunderstand delicacy when it comes to those that first type of counterfactual right way or trying to reason about what things would be like if things were different in some way from the actual world um interest of my own but look we should maybe get back to uh yeah i guess in the, in the interest of time although it is an interesting path to go down certainly um so where what kind of took us into this area we were talking about um you know hypotheticals and if maybe there is some basis for dismissing certain types of hypotheticals or like maybe that basis depends on the purpose the hypothetical as we're talking about these kind of things now i think what stefan wants to say is something like the hypothetical is just too far removed from reality to be taken seriously but if for example the goal of the hypothetical is simply to show a contradiction in the other person's position i don't see how that criticism would be relevant like it doesn't matter if I have to create like you know what whatever it is a swamp man or a, a dividing human or something like that. Um, bottom line, if that gets you to affirm a proposition and its negation, that shows that your position is contradictory. Do you guys see a problem with that? Um, not really. Although I will say that it seems to me that when we're talking about hypotheticals that are, like you said, really far removed from reality, um, the sort of bullet to bite becomes less and less, right? So if if someone has all, let's say, some huge, you know, uh, conjunction of and uh, reasons for what's what, you know, uh, separates the value of a eating human versus an animal, and you have to construct this really, really elaborate um, hypothetical to to sort of create some contradiction the the more and more you have to add the less and less it's going to be like it's not going to feel as much of a, a problem for that person presumably unless it's like really like little trivial things that make no difference um no go ahead well yeah I'm, I'm inclined to agree with that um but i think i mean you tell me if you disagree but i think that this hypothetical is still firmly in the range that the vast majority of people would feel uncomfortable with it so for example, like, like, let's just let's just actually think about it. I mean, if there's disabled people out there who can't reproduce and who can't be cured and they make up some significant amount of the population, like, do any of us feel as though it would be fine to just kill those people? I mean, I think that my intuitions are perfectly clear there. And I think most people's intuitions are perfectly clear there. Yeah, I think I would agree. Although, do you think that intuition tracks well with further and further quote unquote away from uh the actual world hypotheticals okay so I, don't, I, I i'm worrying immediately that i've committed myself to something weird by using the word intuition like i could just say something like moral evaluation like i just well yeah yeah so hmm. I, I don't mean to interrupt but just go the it. example i was using before for instance with swamp man right i don't know if you're familiar with the, the thought experiment but this the idea is now. that it's uh, very, very roughly. It's, it, the the part that people don't like is that it's about a guy who's walking in a swamp. A lightning, um, he he dies, and then lightning forms an exact replica next to him, right? Mm. And then there's there, it has something to do with uh, the. That's not it's not really important what the what he's trying to say. But the point is that when we try and the argument is trying to use intuition um, to to get to some to end right and the idea is that when we're constructing hypotheticals that are so far removed from reality the intuition that we may get get from it is just useless is what might some people have said so i'm just curious what you think about that um if the hypothetical is far enough removed from reality the intuition we get from it might be useless um it's not clear to me why that would be true i mean it seems it seems more obviously true to me if we talk about something like I don't know maybe like like physics or science or something like this where like if we remove enough factors our reasoning ability gets like you know it's it's like it, it might become way harder to reason about that situation. Um, in fact, now that I say that, I don't honestly I don't even know if I don't even know if that makes much sense. Like, look with these kind of situations, I'm I'm just thinking about are kind of like the moral evaluation we make. And what I'm looking for is just a situation where most people will make a perfectly clear moral evaluation. Um, so 
I don't know. I mean, like, I, it seems it seems like let's just apply that criticism to this specific instance. Um, I think that you'd have a hard time convincing people that um, their intuitions are, are going so far awry there or something that they actually should be comfortable with, you know, killing these disabled people. There might, there's, so uh, with respect to your point, like, I don't know, maybe, maybe it is the case that our, um, our intuitions become less useful the further we, or less likely to be true, the further we get away from reality. Um, but I still am just inclined to defend this specific hypothetical because it's the one I, I used in debate. And it just seems like, I think, I think with the conditions I gave, you'd have a very hard time getting most people to abandon the intuition they have there about the moral value of the being. So I don't know if that fully addresses what you're asking about. Um, I think I think uh, I would probably agree with that. I think um, at least with I th maybe we shouldn't go too far awry with like possible hypotheticals and more so what you actually gave. Um, I think that one was probably perfectly reasonable. I, I never saw any issue with it. And um, one thing that I found kind of strange was that uh, for some reason like essentialism kept popping up. Um, <laughs> Where I, f I forgot exactly what was being said, but something like, "Oh well, they're not humans anymore, right?" Mm -hmm. Because I think it was when you were talking about, um, yeah, because uh, I, I think in in uh, when you were talking about them not being able to r produce uh, healthy humans or something, and they said, "Well, oh, those people," were, I could be wrong, so you know, don't don't quote me on this. But there was some point where he was saying, "Well, they're just not humans anymore," mm -hmm. um, because yeah. I think in that case, if a if, if 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 suppose we agree that there are essential properties and properties that when so, when some x has an essential property y, right? If any possible world x is instantiated, it has to have y, right? In mm -hmm. those kind of cases, if we construct hypotheticals that re reject that, suppose like I, I think that some x does have a y uh, mm -hmm. essential property, sure. and I say, oh well, suppose a hypothetical where it didn't have this property, then we might be running into some issues, yeah, um, depending yeah. on how you view um, like essential versus accidental properties. But I don't think anyone. Would, I don't know anyone who would accept the view, even people who accept essential properties, that humans have that specific property. But I think even if that might work for other properties, I think it would totally fail for this specific conversation. Uh, sorry, the specific property being the ability to produce further beings which can engage in abstract moral reasoning? It, yeah, it was something. I, I don't remember. It was whilst I watched it, but I think there was a period where he was like, well, those, those things aren't human. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, um, well, the essential properties stuff, like, okay, so so I definitely grant that if the person we're talking to thinks that there are essential properties, and um, we give a hypothetical where some being or object or whatever doesn't have one of its essential properties, that's just going to be incoherent to them. Um, I don't think that would pose a problem for the argument. Like, I can still run the argument if someone's going to try to do something like that, but I, I grant what you're saying there. Um, and then, w yeah, what he was doing was very weird. So I think that that was when he was trying to play around with what he meant by, like, the category of human and trying to say, like, you know, trying to just, like, exclude those beings uh, and just say, like, you know, somehow they wouldn't even be in the category. And it was weird because... At the start, he it, like he was talking about what the category could do, and I would talk about you know disabled people, and they you know fall within the category. But then later, he started sort of saying the category is defined by like the normal function of its members, and then even if the majority like naturally evolved to have normal function, that's you know similar to like a, a disabled person or something like this, that somehow that's still not like the normal function that defines the category. Um, all, all of that I put in that kind of second bucket of like not modifying the hypothetical and accepting, but instead trying to like pick some problem with the hypothetical. Like, oh, you're not tracking what I mean by like category human, something like this. Yeah, I thought that part was particularly confusing um, because there was this uh, clash between a kind of... Um, so if if you think about species in terms of like... Um, a bunch of essential properties. What you're doing is rejecting the kind of Darwinian um, picture, right? And going to something like an Aristotelian view, like where the, spe the species man, uh, mankind, or whatever, would be like the rational animal, some, some you know necessary and sufficient conditions that all and only humans have, or something. But um, 
mixing that with the sort of more Darwinian view, which would be something like um, individuals belong to the same species um, when they can produce offspring, uh, healthy offspring that can reproduce themselves or something, right? Like, um, and then in in that definition, um, it, it's obviously compatible with um, things turning from you know single celled um, organisms right through the animal kingdom all the way up to uh, the animals that we have around us today. So obviously, it would allow um, radical changes in genetic makeup or whatnot, right? So um, there's nothing fixed about that. Then you know you can't say, well, you know, if humans drifted genetically and had radically different properties, um, like they wouldn't be human anymore because there's this fixed Aristotelian idea of what a human is. I mean, like they would have all just faded seamlessly from the people we are now to, to that other thing later on. I mean, like, it, I don't know, it just felt like there was a mixture of two different ideas of uh, speciesism or something, like essentialism versus uh, Darwinism or something like that. I can't quite put my finger on how that worked, but there was something very confusing about the switch between those two. And he either appealed to, like, you know, the definition of rabbit or something. Uh, I don't think it's a definition of rabbit. Right? It's, you know, from a Darwinian point of view, it's just grounded in, like, a bunch of beings that can reproduce with each other. It's no definition. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and there would be, a, 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 like, this is obvious to anyone who knows, like, kind of basic stuff about evolution, but there would just be a fuzzy point of when exactly... A rabbit came to exist like there wasn't necessarily a first rabbit there is just progressive steps towards rabbitness yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah um i want to uh just go for one second i guess this is kind of backtracking but just to steal man stefan so um p.s you made a case at the start about how like look, if, if we can't engage in hypotheticals, like, we're just giving up on, like, pretty much philosophy and, like, a massive amount of science. Like, we're just gonna lose so much stuff. It's like if you try to, like, lose the, you know, like, conditional statements and do logic or something. It's just gonna, like, take a, a huge bite out of what you're able to do. Now, I think um, uh, that's obviously true, but I think Stefan would try to say he he accepts the hypotheticals based on their proximity to reality but i think there's like kind of two two criticisms i have for that so like one would be just that that seems kind of like an arbitrary threshold right it seems like you can just kind of conveniently like set it so that you don't have to interact with hypotheticals you don't like and then the second would be sort of a point that i already made which is just like look if the purpose of the hypothetical is just to show a contradiction and it does that you know that's that's just what it does and it doesn't really matter what was involved in the hypothetical um, I, I think maybe this is a. I, I, I originally said something about how um, something has to be, uh, something can't be necessary. But now I'm thinking about it based on your first point. I'm not sure that's even the case. Like when we do, for instance, like a proof by contradiction, right? Mm -hmm. We're it's like say we take some, you know, like classic proof. Like square root of two is irrational, right? Mm -hmm. um, the classic proof that assumes that it is rational, right? And suppose I run the proof. You say, oh well, no, no, no. I mean, that mathematical statements are necessary. So that's a way you can't you can't assume that, right? We would have to just give up unless there's some principal distinction. We have to just give up any sort of uh, reductio or proof by contradiction because we're supposing a, 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 the negation of some necessary fact. So I'm not even sure I would agree with that first point where it has to be close to proximity. I think when we're talking about physical. Um, uh, hypotheticals, then maybe there's a case for that. But I think, like, hypothetical simpliciter, I'm not even sure that's true. Um, but I, no, I absolutely agree with your your second point, that I think that moral discourse just requires, like, like if someone if someone gave you the trolley problem, you're like, wait, that, that's ridiculous. Why would they be on the tracks, right? Like, who would put them there? Like, that's just a horrible <laughs> objection. <right? laughs> Every time you guys say things like that, it really makes me laugh. Like, um, like no yeah. one... No one would take that objection seriously. <laughs> it's it's just, like, oh, well, well, we'll just find an engineer who can fix the problem. Like, it just—it's totally irrelevant. That's not the <laughs> yeah. point. There. Yeah, that's exactly. <laughs> it's just missing the point to like such a funny degree. And so um, that's like um, if Stefan was like saying, "So what's going on in this world? Why are there only like three people tied to a track, and there's one guy deciding <laughs> blah blah blah? What's going on? Why hasn't he got a job to go to? Where's his mum? Why isn't he <laughs> cloning him?" 
Right. Like, it doesn't matter. That's all just... And if you tried to answer each one of them, let's just say he doesn't have his phone on him, and let's just say it's like a Sunday, so no one's around, and like, blah, blah, blah. Like, it's going down the rabbit hole. Um, I don't know, it just feels like uh, you're sort of playing his game then, rather than, I mean, a pointless, kind of insane Mad Hatter game where nothing (laughs) rules or whatever, and it's just like, what are we even doing? But like... Uh, it's yeah I don't know I think I would have found it very challenging talking to him because he's quick and um, confident and it's difficult to like get to the point you wanted to make uh, mm-hmm. but yeah you know, I, I think that was exactly right the, the idea of that kind of insane objection to the trolley problem kind of captured it perfectly yeah in, in fact there is there is a comment on my video to that effect it, it was it was really quite funny i'll i'll send it to you guys after so it, like someone just made a comment of like a hypothetical conversation so like someone asks stefan about the trolley problem and he just raises all these like hilarious issues about the trolley right. um someone else made another good point like I mean, okay, so the trolley problem, just for anyone who who doesn't know, is just you have, you know, a trolley, it's going down a track, it's going to hit five people, you can flip a switch and it'll go to another track and hit just one person, and, you know, we use this when we're talking about things like maybe like consequentialism and deontology or like normative ethics, like a consequentialist will say let it hit the five, um, or or, sorry, sorry, a consequentialist will say switch it to hit the one, the deontologist will say, you know, don't switch it to hit the one because then you're actually actively engaging in the murder and there's something wrong with that. Um, So that's kind of the purpose of the hypothetical. Now, someone could say, I I could give you this hypothetical. There's, There's a magic there's a train to Hogwarts going down a magic track and, and it's going to hit, you know, one, it's going to hit five ogres if it goes down this way, or you can flip the switch and it'll just hit one leprechaun, you know, or I guess we'll use one ogre to keep it consistent. What do you choose? And the, the, the point is just like, that wouldn't change the nature of, of the hypothetical, uh, meaningfully, like with respect to the thing we're trying to get at, which is this sort of like normative moral evaluation that, and, picking problems with the hypothetical like well i mean look hogwarts like <laughs> what, what are you talking about would just be to miss the point yeah there was a bit where um you uh you described like uh the situation as if it was like a world where um i, don't, I can't remember like everyone was suffering from the disease or something like that anyway he, he did that um, I, I, I oh oh sorry sorry i see what you're saying my bad yeah but then um uh, you had to say to him like no, but you're not in the situation oh, yeah. right we're just making a decision about the situation from outside yeah. and he's like oh what so i'm hovering outside the universe <laughs> looking in the-. And it's like such a such an overreaction because you know just read a book right like read any like classic <laughs> book decide uh is the character like being a dick right now or not you don't have to go oh well i'm supposed to be floating outside the universe <laughs> <laughs> well I, and i mean look that that's just i this is something i realized after with that one that's just a problem you could raise for any hypothetical that that like um so, oh sorry i have to think this through properly um it, it seems like a problem you could raise for like any hypothetical that doesn't contain you or something like like how am i evaluating this if i'm not in it it's like i mean what what are you talking about like why would you need to be in the hypothetical to evaluate the hypothetical it just seems like an insane thing to say like i mean look if i give you some hypothetical and it's like you know alex say that you you know instead of having this conversation like you went and murdered someone like do you think you would have acted ethically I mean, it would just be so silly for you to say something like, well, like, I'm here. <laughs> like, I'm, how, how, how could I be, like, how, how could I possibly think about that unless I, it's just like, what, what are, what do you mean? Just completely missing the point. Yeah. Um, okay, well, look, I think we're, um, we're, we're saying a lot of the same things. Uh, maybe we'll just go over, like, one or two more things and call it. Um, so, one thing I wanted to, I mentioned this sort of when I did my little take at the start, and I just want um, your guys' takes on this, because this seems straightforward to me, but, you know, maybe I'm maybe I'm missing something. So, um, say that, you know, like, P.S., I ask you, um, you know, what are the sufficient conditions to justify murdering a human? And you say something like, uh, they're attacking me, right? And then, or... or 
here, here, let me let me uh, let me just think for one second of, of a better way to do this. Um, it's generating the example that's boggling my mind. I'm gonna just talk about it in the abstract, and then we can do an example if we need to. So, a problem that I have is that if you're asked for the necessary conditions for something and you give them, then you're saying, as long as these conditions are met, you know, X follows. In this case, like I'm okay with murder, right? As mm -hmm. long as the this set of conditions is met. Now, there's a range of possible worlds where that set of conditions are met. If you were then shown some unpalatable conclusion to what you've said, reacting, reacting by adding a property to the hypothetical that isn't entailed by your necessary conditions, it's just, it's just some additional thing, that, and, then, and then giving a statement about whether, in this case, the murder is okay or not, that's you talking about a subset of the possible worlds where your justification applies when really your justification applies to this whole set of possible worlds where those necessary conditions are met so it seems basically like a red herring it's like you've made a statement that justifies murder in this set of possible worlds but instead you go to a smaller subset of it where it actually seems to make sense to murder and say oh it's fine well just ignoring the whole other chunk that's justified by what you put forward um so that that adding of a factor and then responding only to the subset where you add the factor seems to me like a red herring because it's not addressing the whole category where you said it's okay to commit the action in this case murder does that does that make sense do you guys agree or am i making an error i i think i agree i think you don't even need to talk about sets of possible worlds i think mean, you just talk about one possible world and you're straightforwardly changing it hmm, maybe that's a easier way to think about it um, yeah, I think that's right because what you're doing is trying to show, um, like, I mean, it doesn't have to, so right. Obviously, you don't have to show that in every world um, there's the consequence that you're bringing up. What you're trying to do is say there's some world where Stefan's principles apply, but that the opposite consequence pops out, right? Like. It, mm -hmm. so, so his calculation is uh, if you apply these rules then the outcome should be something moral follows from it and what you're trying to show is there's at least one situation where you apply these rules but something immoral pops up right? and that's the head scratcher that you're trying to show that, that mm -hmm. undermines the idea that those rules can be correct mm -hmm. and so you don't, yeah, you don't need it to be a subset you, do, you only need it to be one right? that, and that's, that's why um, it's like if you have um, if you're if you're trying to establish like a principle in logic, if you're trying to prove a theorem or something, you only need like one counter model to show that the theorem's false, um, right? That's mm -hmm. so it's kind of a method of disproof like that. You're trying to show that his principles can't be applied universally or something. Does that feel right to you? It, it does. Um, I, I feel like I can still defend what I'm saying, but it's kind of pedantic and not not that meaningful. Like if you if you're just making a statement like look, when these three conditions are met, it's fine to commit murder. Like, we could agree that those three conditions are met in more than one possible world, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. So we'd say murder is okay in that whole set of possible worlds. And then if you add a further condition that you didn't initially specify, and then, then we're talking about a subset of that original set of possible worlds, right? So if there's like three conditions that that have to be there we're gonna have a set of possible worlds if you add a fourth it's just gonna narrow the set a little bit so i think i think it does make sense to think about it in that terms but in those terms but uh, unless you're gonna show me why it doesn't but i'm fine with the way you're talking about it also it's just like just you can just think about it being one hypothetical and he's just changing it he's just adding something that you didn't put there i'm kind of fine with either that seems like a more straightforward way to talk about it so Fine with yeah, that. I think that was just my point. I think it's just more straightforward because when we're talking about sets and subsets, they might get confused. They might say, well, you know, this and this, what about this subset? But instead of just saying there's one possible world and if they try to move it, just like, no, 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 we're talking about this possible world, right? Then there's, there's, it just mm -hmm. seems straightforward. But I think they're sure. equivalent. There's no, there's no principle. There's no uh, other reason that we should prefer one over the other. Okay, now I... I remember, uh, Alex, you had a point you wanted to make that you're making in text. Um, it was about his, um, when he tried to say it's impossible to know that there wouldn't be a cure. Yeah, okay, so 
so this was an example it seemed to me of like um uh like a tactical nuke of um radical skepticism right <laughs> and the problem with using it a tactical nuke is that there's like um fallout from that that you didn't expect that comes your way after you've used it mm. it's not a very good weapon to detonate um so what i mean is um so there was a point where let me see if i can remember all the pieces so i think what what was going on was you were saying um all right so let's just imagine that there are these beings that have like um diminished moral reasoning capacity mm-hmm. um and what whatever right that um and they're bestruck by some disease right um and there's no cure for the disease and then he was like whoa 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 hold on a what are you saying we have to be like omniscient like how do we know there's no cure for the disease um and that's the point where he detonated the radical skepticism tactical nuke um because it's like i mean okay if that's the standard if we're getting all like super defensive about like being able to make like mundane knowledge claims the problem is that like the blowback is that um you know he wanted to say well Uh, the thing is an actual cow can't reproduce um and produce a human (laughs) and it sounds really stupid but like um so he was saying well maybe in the future there'll be some like cure that cures these people like you can't say that there there's no cure and that was separates real world cases he was saying because in the real world we wouldn't know there was no cure right we'd always hold out hope that there might be a cure and in this hypothetical you were painting he was saying you'd never really know this is where the cat god thing came in mm-hmm. you'd have to have a cat god telling you that there was no cure or something right but the thing is i mean okay if we're so the problem is once you detonate that bomb we've got like the resources of skepticism available on our side as well right so i mean don't tell me a cow can't reproduce uh, and make a human because are you omniscient do you know that there'll never be a future technology like some star trek ray gun thing that you can like you know whiz over a cow and somehow a baby a human baby pops out i mean are you telling do you know that for sure right like or or an intelligence razor like if 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 we can't if we can't be certain that there's no way to raise the human's intelligence up to normal how can we be certain that there's not a way to raise the cow's intelligence up to normal absolutely yeah so what it does is it just sort of breaks down the um the barriers but it's also unnecessary because um uh i mean Look, if we say there's no cure for a disease, I mean, it, you can take that in lots of ways that are perfectly reasonable. Like, I mean, so there are uncurable diseases right now, right? I mean, and, and I gave you an extreme example the other day, but like, if I, you know, put a bullet in your head and as you were collapsing down on the ground, I, you know, half of your head exploded or whatever, and I say to PS, you know, no coming back from that, and he like you know looks at me aghast and says are you omniscient do you know that like that's that's just ridiculous right like the point is maybe there's a star trek ray gun that can like p- grab all the atoms and like put them back in exactly the way that they were before i shot you in the head but i mean it's it's you know a long way off in the future with current technology right mm-hmm. we, that's definitely not possible so when i say um it, there's no coming back from that right that's like an incurable affliction you've got I mean something like you know no one at the moment knows how to do anything sure. about that um and 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 you can even go up a grade a little bit by saying you know there's no prospect of anyone coming up with a a cure for that type of illness right like in the near future mm-hmm. and then you can factor in these perfectly reasonable ways of understanding what that means right um another way of looking at it might be let's say i get diagnosed with a disease and it's not just that there's no prospect of it being cured but there's no prospect of it being cured in my lifetime, right? Maybe it'll be curable in a hundred years or something, but not the, the prognosis is like six months. So like, I'm I'm screwed in that situation. So it's, it's reasonable to say of me that I, it's uncurable, right? It's no, no point, you know, Stefan saying maybe in a million years some someone will come up like that's just point that's irrelevant, and it's to misconstrue the sense of the term, right? So when you say, let's just say it's. Um, uncurable you can just mean it in any of those kind of senses right it's just mm-hmm. there's no prospect of it being cured uh in any way that will be meaningful right it's, it's so far off that it won't make any difference and it just seems to me like once you bring that back in then that whole defense that he had which is that this is an, a completely different from 
uh, the actual world because you have to bring in wizards and blah, blah, blah. Like, you don't have to do that. You just have to, like, not detonate the skeptical nuke, right, and just talk normally about what the claim actually entails. It has nothing to do with being omniscient. And then once you do that, it massively diffuses uh, one of the main lines of uh, obfuscation that he was bringing out, it seems to me. So, And I wish you'd have made that point at the time, but I completely um, understand that he's a slippery fish, and I don't <laughs> think I'd have caught him that myself either. So. Well, yeah, I mean, well, here, here, speaking of this, actually, um, and also I know you're on a timer, uh, Alex, how much longer do you have? Um, I think I'll be all right for a little bit. Okay, yeah, we'll, okay, we'll, we'll wrap up pretty quick. Um, I was just going to ask, uh, criticism-wise, do you guys have any, any criticism for me? I can give myself a criticism right now, which is, I think that I was um, too charitable for too long. I think that watching the debate back, like, look, you know sometimes you give someone a hypothetical and they just seem a bit confused, so you, you just give it a bit of, uh, like, you, you help paint it a bit, you add some features to sort of just make it more clear and so it kind of goes down better. Um, I think that I think that every time I did that with the honest intention of like just trying to make the hypothetical easier for him to understand, he would capitalize on it and like use use the very things I, I put in to make it easier to understand. Like, oh, maybe it's a genetic disease to like try to create some kind of problem with it. So that's one criticism I think I have for myself. I could have been more, um, I, I think I could have been quicker to, to realize that he's capitalizing on my charitability. Um, and then another one is, I accidentally at one point made the mistake of calling his uh, modifications on the hypothetical consequences of the hypothetical, which they're not consequences of the hypothetical. They are additions to the hypothetical, which are not entailed by the hypothetical. Uh, do you guys have any that you can think of? Um, I think uh, I would probably agree with you. For I think when I was wa when I was listening to it um, a little bit bit back ago, I was. I think you were being a little bit too. Um, you were giving him too much space. I think, if that makes sense, you were you were allowing him like you. I think you could have pushed back way harder and said, "Well, well, that's totally irrelevant." You know, this is important. Mm -hmm. You were being, I think, too, I, yeah. Obviously, you should be nice in the debate, but I think you were being very, very charitable, like you said. Um, and so you were kind of entertaining him, and then he just kept, you know, dry. He just kept pushing. In the, in the wrong direction, right? And so it didn't really go as far as it could have. And he just ended up dodging the entire thing, right? Just by saying, well, you know, what about this and this? And you kept entertaining that, right? So I think that's just one... I wouldn't even really call that a bad thing. It's just being nice, right? I don't know if that's, it's fair to say that being nice is a bad thing, but... Um, I, th I think be being nice when it's clear someone's capitalizing on the niceness to do something that's not in your interest, I think I think it's fair to say that's a bad thing. Yeah, I don't know if he was doing, like you said, I don't know if he was doing it intentionally or if he was just... That's uh, sure, sure, yeah, 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 I don't mean to attribute intention. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But other than that, I, I thought you did a good job. Okay. Um, you have any uh, you have any criticisms you can think of, uh, Malpass? Um, other than not thinking of the things that I thought of to say. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but I suppose I think... Um, he obviously, he, I mean, he even said, and it was, it was, um, there was some kind of note of regret at this point towards the end where he said something like, oh, I'd spent ages, like, researching, um, I can't remember what it was, yep. but, like, you know, like, land usage sure. with vegetables yeah. versus animals or something like that. And it was as if he was quite sad that he had a couple of facts, like, written on his arm that he wanted to say and didn't get to say them. Um, uh, but I think what that showed was that he was expecting a different type of conversation. Mm -hmm. And what I think he was preparing for was, like, um, not really a, a philosophical conversation as much as a kind of, like, I don't know, political or, or sort of moral, but in a less abstract sense. I, I think what he got was um, a, a kind of metaphysics of veganism debate, which he wasn't prepared for. And, um, you know, like uh, we were talking, you know, that's why essentialism and stuff is coming up, like trait switching and stuff. It's, mm -hmm. it's quite, um, you know, you have to kind of... Um, be ready to have that type of abstract conversation. I, I think possibly he he needed to be prepared more, battered up a bit, ready for like having that type of conversation. Because I think some of this um, pedantry was a kind of knee jerk, um, like treading water or something, trying to um, deal with an unexpected type of uh, debate. And, and I think well, one sorry one other point I think was um, uh, I I think I guess 
um, my approach to this, I think I would have probably just like presented the alternative view. Um, so instead of saying, so so what was going on was you were contrast, you were trying to say, look, there, there's this weird consequence for your view, right? Mm-hmm. That like you can plug in whatever values you're, you think is the moral calculus and what pops out is I'll be able to come up with a situation that, that's really weird and counterintuitive where mm-hmm. it doesn't look right to say that it's that we should be killing those creatures or whatever. Yep. Um, I think in order to sort of help the... Um, to ease them over to the other side. I think it's like the positive case could be made as well instead mm-hmm. of just sort of like saying your your view leads to this craziness. I mean, because it, it feels like, you know, there's this easy alternative to that, which is to say something like um, the moral value is sort of connected to the capacity of suffering or something. Yeah. And like, it doesn't really, like the whether they belong to this group or whether they've got that capacity and you're sort of tying yourself up in knots trying to like make sense of it all. Um, whereas if you just say, Look, it's just it's just like wrong to make things suffer, and they don't suffer in exactly the same way as us, but like in a sort of morally significant way they do, and like that's it. That's it's really simple and straightforward, and you don't have to worry about like uh, the metaphysics of essentialism and stuff. It's just like it's really straightforward. I don't know. Maybe you've had that conversation so many times you don't like having. Um, you've, you've had all the objections to that already, well, but I don't. Know. Well, that's no, I, I, I think what you're saying makes sense. So, I mean, if I had to sum it up, you're basically saying instead of just pointing out the bad part of his view, just provide an alternative that doesn't have those problems. So then it's it's like, it, it just makes the case seem stronger. It's like, look, here, you could just value them based on their capacity for well-being, and then you won't get that kind of result. Um, that will, that, that kind of makes my side seem more reasonable. I'm into that. The thing that, um, the, the thing, like, I have had thoughts about doing that before, um, the thing that holds me back is just that sometimes people use that to derail from the problem with their view and then try to turn yeah. it into an internal critique on my view, which, uh, like, I mean, I'm I'm fine with that. Like, I'm, I'm happy to play defense, but it's like, if I have the offense, like, I some I like to I like to keep it instead of like opening up this like random kind of pathway of, of attack for them. But you know, I don't. I don't ultimately know what's more effective. So you could just be right that that's a better way to proceed. Yeah, I don't know if it would be more effective. Like, I don't know if it'd be more effective. I guess, but I. I just think that. Um, uh, yeah, lay, laying out both the negative and the positive, like saying, look, it's super difficult on this side, but you could just sidestep all those difficulties yeah. by making this, yeah. and it just sort yeah. of makes the it's that itself can be. So just the difficulty with the alternatives itself can be a positive argument for a position. Mm-hmm. Um, and sometimes when these positions are quite abstract and difficult to, um, you know, like prove, prove or something, just the fact that all the other alternatives seem really weird and difficult uh, is itself a reason to, to adopt something. And, and that's stra- straightforward way that philosophers um, like to present their arguments and stuff. So. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I mean, my my approach to debate is trial and error. So I'll try try adding that in. Do a few debates, see what kind of results I get, and I'll get back to you. Um. All right, guys. Well, look. I mean, I think we've I think we've been over the the gist of it. Um. I don't know if you have any other points. You're welcome to make them. Uh. uh maybe we can get a a closing note that we all agree on here. Um. I think that in closing, could we agree with the general view that this was just two hours of Stefan avoiding a hypothetical that showed a problem with his position, regardless of whether that avoidance was intentional or not? Uh, yeah, I think I could agree to that. That's what it sounded like, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, on that note, um, unless you guys have any other things you want to say? I don't know. I think... Um... I think I'm uh, pretty much good. I think there's also I think there's a lot of things to say about uh, hypotheticals that are maybe more interesting than what uh, your 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 debater was saying. Mm-hmm. Um, but I just I, I just don't think they're relevant to this conversation at all. I think because when people when people generally and there are people like I said who are skeptical of hypotheticals and hypothetical reasoning, they don't make bad arguments like what you were uh, exposed to. So it's a shame because I think there's a lot of interesting like literature on this. It's just that it's totally irrelevant to the point that uh, Stefan was making. <laughs> well, yeah, I think Stefan's quite um, 
ignorant of a, a lot of, I mean, I want to say like almost all contemporary philosophy. <laughs> um, he does, I mean, he references some things, you know, like uh, Plato, Aristotle, and a really kind of cookie cutter standard um, intro to philosophy kind of things, but I don't think he's read very much uh, contemporary analytic philosophy at all, really. I'd probably say almost none. So, yeah, there was a kind of clash there. He he thinks he's doing philosophy. I don't think he does. Yeah. You describe him as having the most popular YouTube philosophy channel, but he doesn't have a, a YouTube philosophy channel. He's just <laughs> <what he does. laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, one one point that you once made that was funny was when he didn't know what a hypothetical norm is, which again, it's fine. It's fine to not know what these things are, but it's it's not fine to bill yourself as the largest philosophy channel on YouTube and not know what a hypothetical norm is. <laughs> yeah, and write books on moral philosophy. <laughs> oh, uh, Alex, th this one would have really triggered you. He uh, he wrote a book called uh, The Art of the Argument. And mm -hmm. you can uh, you can find a video on Destiny's channel where um, he's uh, he, he's got some screenshots up there um, from the original issue, and he, so he's writing a book about argumentation, and he was misusing words like validity and soundness. I mean, don't don't take my word for it. Go see for yourself. But assuming that's the case, I mean, that would be a a pretty like crazy thing to be doing writing a book about arguments while not knowing what validity and soundness are yeah i think i've come across that before and in that rationality rules thing there was a bit where he was like libertarian free will i've never heard of that <laughs> before that? It's like what the fuck like <laughs> uh that was funny uh, okay well you know i thought we might get more disagreement was a bit of a circle jerk but you know sometimes that happens when someone makes bad points it was great talking to you guys, and uh, I hope we hope we do it again soon. Hope you had fun. Cool. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Peace.